So here I'm, this is a very informal presentation. I, we, I basically winged it this morning and decided um, to write some stuff on the board and bring, bring up a point that's been in my head for quite some time. It's, it's been like a, a, a sense I had that we'd eventually go this direction. So I thought I'd finally bring it up. Uh, I it's come up in forms in the past, but I thought I'd um, just give it to you fresh. So um, first of all, to define the term, uh, knowledge transfer, Jeff, Jeff used that term a few weeks ago for the first time to describe a problem of, I mean, in the thousand brands theory, you have this general set of scenarios where one cortical column, you want it to use information that was learned or picked up from another cortical column. Uh, you can frame this in different ways. You can frame it as you learn, you, you learn over here and then you pass that knowledge over here and, and, and learn in both places, even though maybe this column over here never actually received a certain input. It still learns things that was, where learns information that was originally obtained over here. Uh, that's one possibility. That's one way of, yeah, that's one way of phrasing it. The, you can take that and subtly change it to where it's not so much a learning, it's more of an inference thing. Uh, there, there are different ways of describing this. That's the, but yes, that's yeah, one thing you can learn in one place and then use it in the other. Yes, place. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And in some of the extreme examples, they could be completely different sensory modalities. Yeah. 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 So the, this is the the general problem space where I'm a, of of knowledge transfer, and uh, an observation I'm, I'd like to make is um, well. If we keep landing on a certain solution or the different flavors of that solution, uh, I'd say the first one. So, uh, so here I'll, I'll describe the diagram here. I'm showing three cortical columns, and somehow they're communicating a description of an object, not just an object ID, but some actual like you know set of parts and their relations to each other being communicated across like horizontally. Uh, we have arrived on that um, that solution in many different flavors. I think the first one I remember is Subutai back years ago, doing it with shared feature location pairs. Uh, and this goes back a little bit into the mindset of, um, you, you go back to the columns paper and others, um, and we had feature location pairs being represented in layer four. And if somehow you could make those shared between objects, then the horizontal connections could could do the job. At that point, it might not be layer four anymore. But anyway, um, that was like an, an, an original version of this idea. Um, shortly after, I did something really similar with, um, I was, this was for me uh, with displacement cells using, you know, the, 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 you know, the transform between two unique object spaces and storing a bunch of those. Uh, to one of the exciting parts of that was that now you could have that be the thing that you're passing sideways. Uh, and th that would be a way of communicating descriptions of objects uh, horizontally. Um, I don't think anyone else ever liked that idea because <laughs> that particular aspect of displacement cells, one thing about that was that that would, that would mean all these columns would have to have the same grid cell space. They would have to share grid cell space in order to communicate that. So uh, it, that wasn't universally liked here, <laughs> but, but that was part of the appeal of this. But, um, more recently, um, we were talking about graphs a lot, and Jeff has pointed out that um, that the graph can somehow be communicated horizontally in a way that uh, a, piece, a piece of the graph. Yeah, yeah, sure. P no, not a whole thing. Okay, no. I see. I see. Pieces of the graph can be communicated horizontally. Um, so my first observation is like this diagram. I mean, keeps coming back in various forms where we just label things a little bit differently, and. Um, and so to me, like if I just jump ahead like a year or two and think of where, where, where this leads if we go down this road, um, I start to think of the cortical column a little differently. Uh, um, and I start, of, I start thinking, it, I'll, I'll just like give you kind of like the spoiler of the end result and build up to it. I start thinking of it as more the cortical column is learning a language for representing, uh, learning a language for describing objects. It's learning how to take some representation, a description of an object, and, and, um, and once it has that description, it, it, it's, it's predictive. It's a predictive model of an object. It just needs to be fed a description. 
maybe it's fed that description from its own memory. Maybe the cortical column has memorized a particular coffee cup, or maybe it receives it from elsewhere. Maybe it receives it horizontally from other columns. It uses knowledge that's elsewhere, as Jeff just put it. Uh, and I start to, uh, 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 I'll, I'll describe these pictures in a second. I start to uh, shift my knowledge where the fundamental thing a cortical column is doing. Maybe this is just like narrative opinion, but like maybe both are important. But in my mind, the fundamental thing is the cortical column learns to, okay, I have to introduce the pictures, the analogy, I realize. <laughs> so um, I, I'm, I'm influenced by Douglas Hofstadter here and Gerd Escher Bach, which I've read like two thirds of. Uh, he uses a record player analogy. He, Are you reading it now? You no, it was like it was years ago. I read, I read two thirds of it. We'll see when I get to the final third. So, um, by the way, it was not. <laughs> I read parts of Gödel, Escher, and Bach. It's not just one of them. It was cut up anyway. <laughs> uh, bad joke. The um, in it. Um, he likes to use the analogy of a record player, and um, and I don't need to go super deep into it, but it kind of stuck in my mind the, the notion that like a, a record player is something that takes a description of a song and plays it. The information lies in the record, uh, but it, the record player, like what it um, what it has been engineered to do, it doesn't learn to do. But what it has been engineered to do is be able to take a description of a song and play it. And that uh, literally for like four years, I've been uh, three or years or so. This analogy has been in my head that cortical column takes a description of an object and plays it, so to speak. Uh, it takes a description. It can use it to make predictions. It can use it for another scenario. I'll talk about in a second. Uh, the, so you know, the the idea of yeah, the the cortical column as an object player. So fundamentally, the cortical column learns to play novel objects given a description. Secondarily, importantly, but secondarily in terms of a learning problem, um, it can memorize those descriptions. Once you have some activation pattern here that describes an object, memorizing it, memorizing a particular coffee cup um, is a straightforward problem. The difficult, the, the advanced problem with solving is learning the language for expressing the objects. Uh, uh, yes. Quick thought. So from GB, wasn't this, uh, uh, wasn't the argument coming from, uh, uh, coming from the fact that he was saying this sort of like a Turing machine with a, you know, with a tape, where the description of, uh, of the problem uh, lies in the encoding on the tape. Um, maybe he talks about record players in multiple ways, though. Um, the, the, hmm. So, you, like, so if that's the case, then uh, then the tape would also uh, it could serve as external memory, right? Is that different than what Marcus is saying? I'm confused. Um, I mean, is the tape just the description? I'm, 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 sure. I'm going based on my memory from years ago. I mean, the big, this goes off topic though. The, his, the big interesting philosophical question he was asking at the part I'm thinking of is he's comparing record players to jukeboxes and how you're, you're putting in information into it. In one case, you're putting in the true information of the song. In the other case, you're pressing a couple buttons. And so are you actually putting in the information of a song? You have the spectrum of record players and jukeboxes and where the information lies, which is the that's the talking point I remember from the book. Okay. No. Okay, fair enough. But this uh, the record player to jukebox spectrum is a really fun idea, by the way. But that's not what I'm talking about here. <laughs> uh, so a, that, I mean, that's the full content of what I wanted to be the idea I wanted to bring up here. But one one example scenario that a lot of vision scientists think about that we haven't we don't talk about this one that that often. But um, say you have a particular object that you want to succumb to, and you don't know where it is in your visual field. It's, say let's let's use our mental mind. Let, let's use our our um, point of view. Let's say the model of that object has been learned in the past and happens to be in your phobia that you learned it. You learned it in a cortical. Yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> yes, you know exactly what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yes, your your um, your, your B1, the, the cortical column that is processing the input from the phobia has learned this particular object. 
particular object. And now what you want to do is you, you want to saccade to it. Uh, well, you want to it's not to it meaning like you know where it is. No, you you, you want to you want to go to it. You want to you want to find it. Yeah, you want to find You're it. Looking for it. And meanwhile, it is somewhere in your visual field, but you don't know where. Okay. Uh, what you can do is, you, let's just call it a broadcast. You broadcast um, a description of this object, uh, and now the cortical column that. Um, that is processing input from the periphery receives that message all, among others. Uh, and, and it detects, hey, I, I, I see this thing. I, you, you gave me a description of this object. I know what, what I tend to see when an object like that is in my receptive field. And then it, it like outputs maybe essentially a motor command. It, uh, it says like saccade to me, essentially. Uh, this is a plausible mental model to me for like for one of the things that visual cortex is doing. And this notion of passing around descriptions of objects and it living somewhere, mem sometimes it's memorized, sometimes it's not memorized, sometimes it's picked up temporarily and it is passed around. Uh, to me, this is a certain flavor of the thousand brains theory that works for me. And I and I wanted to just bring up that that mental model and see if it's if it if it fits with your mental model, if it's a possibility, if there's something you like yeah, about it, don't no, like about I, it. No, I, 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 can I, is I'm that with Yeah, yep. can I just add some flavor to this? Yeah. So, and I mentioned this recently, but I'll, I'll bring it up again, because I don't think I've ever, we've never written it down, we never drew, drew it on the board. Um, the idea was that, it, where's, a, where's a, um, you know, we talked about, we talked about description of the object, and, and then, what we're really doing, we, I made the point the other day that when we're, we're passing around, we, we talk about voting in the Collins paper. We said, oh, we're voting on the object ID. And then we said, no, we're not really voting on the object ID. We're voting on the object ID, but it's pose too, right? It's it's like um, the pose is, you know, where where is it uh, and how far away, like in direction angle, like it's for me. Well, actually, you know, actually well, no, no, so you take that back. Pose meaning it's orientation to me right at the moment. Um, uh, so uh, there's two poses here. But, right, I should not call it pose because you want to use a pose for something else. Object ID and its orientation. So I don't just see the coffee cup. I see it at a certain angle to me, right? It's not, and I have to vote it. That's because I'm seeing that. That's what I perceive. That's that's what would be voted on. It wouldn't be just the, the it's just not just a coffee cup out there. It's, it's a coffee cup at this particular orientation. Um, but I also argued the following. I said, like, so what, what occurred to me is like, if I see something like I've seen this object, even if I don't know it, but I, I, I know some part, I'm seeing something, maybe a lip, a lip or a whole coffee cup, but I immediately know how to get my hand to it. Right? I, knew, I knew how to get there. And uh, similarly, uh, and I know what it'll feel if I, even if I, even if I close my eyes and I reach out, I'll know what it'll feel like. Similarly, I can be touching something and I know what it's going to look like, even, even before I see it, uh, even a novel thing, but I, I feel something I recognize, oh, there's an edge or a lip or something like that. I know what it's going to look like if I look at it. So that tells me there's this communication going on instantaneously right at that moment, right? And so what, what it seems to be required is what information is going from my visual cortex to my tactile cortex is going to be, um, it's going to be some feature. It could be the feature could be the, the whole cup or it could be the lip. Um, it's, at, it's at some location relative to the body. It's not relative to my eyes or to my, to my um, fingers because that's not very useful. What's useful is to say if there's some common point, we can, we can both agree to it. Like uh, my finger column can know where it is relative to my body, my eye column can know where it is relative to my body. There has to be some central reference point that these two both can agree to. That's why I can reach to it, and even though uh, you know I, I can't see it. Uh, so it's location relative to its body and uh, in its orientation uh, relative to the body. Um, and so this could be like, I could be doing this. Um, so imagine, um, so these, imagine these are the three things that are, that are broadcast. Uh, this is not relative to the eye or the skin. It, it has to come to a central thing, right? It has to come to a central reference thing. And that's how, we, that's how I think about it. I, I think about like, where's the coffee cup? I, when I, if I was trying to remember where the coffee cup was, I said, my episodic memory, like, oh yeah, I picked up that coffee cup this morning. I don't remember where it was to my hand. I remember where it was in my body. I said, yeah, it was on the table right here next to me. Just to make sure I'm not there. 
So this, this was a, a key uh, insight to me was you can do relative to the bottom, relative to the bottom. Now you can do all the things you just talked about because this means um, while I'm, if I'm learning a new object and I'm touching it, um, even if I can't see it, I can actually visualize what it is. I can, I can visualize what it would look like as I go through this. And so if this was broadcasting, imagine you had a bunch of columns here and um, one column is actually getting real sensory input and the other one isn't. This one doesn't get anything, but this information is being transferred back to broadcast all over the place. This column essentially has all the information it needs. This column has all the information it needs to build a model. It says, well, I, there's going to be an edge at some place at this location relative to my body. There's going to be a, a, another curve relative to my body, and I can visually build up this model uh, as I'm learning it here. I could learn it here. Um, now, of course, these are all in reference frames of the body. I have to translate back locally to my eye or to my finger. Um, so there has to be this sort of um, clearinghouse to get that done. But if you, this is what was transferred, then this is what you would, this guy could learn it at the same time. Um, and, um, or um, another thing, it's another very classic example is we do, we always talk about like signing your name with your foot, right? And then, like, you, know, like, you can do that. And of course you never learn to sign your name, but you can do it. And so what's going on here is you're mentally playing back the sequence of movements um, you know, like I'm moving an edge in this direction at some point relative, you know, uh, and, and I can just put it someplace relative to my body so I can reach down and touch it and with my hand, but I can also just imagine doing it with my foot. Uh, and I go through the sequence of features, uh, positions and orientations, features and positions and orientations. And essentially I can draw out the same, if there's some pattern I'm going to draw out here in space, I can draw out the same pattern in space here um, uh, in real time. And I've never learned it else. Um, so it's not like everything's going to be learned everywhere. It's not, it's not like if I learn to sign my name here, my foot's going to learn how to sign my name. Um, but the information's there if I, if I were to broadcast it. Um, I could learn it, or I could do it in real time, um, like with the sign. Um, so uh, again, another example would be imagine if I only learned the coffee cup um, to, uh, with my right hand, and I've never touched it with my left hand. It, there's two scenarios. One is while I'm touching it with my right hand, I learn it with my left hand. The other scenario is I don't. Um, but when I want to do it with my left hand, um, I am not as facile with it. And so what that means is if I've never grasped this thing with my left hand, if I grasp it with my left hand, I won't, one, one touch won't be sufficient. But imagine if I could say, all right, I'm now moving my left hand over the object, and, um, and now I can learn the knowledge of a I have the information over here. So my, all my point is that I don't, we don't have to learn it in both sides um, for this to work. You, you could learn it on one side and then infer on the other side, but it would be slower because there's no knowledge of the entire coffee cup over here. All I'm going to be doing is going, right, okay, a coffee cup has got an edge and a surface and a handle, and I can, I, can, I can pick those pieces up here because I've learned over here edges and surfaces, even though I haven't learned the entire coffee cup. So I guess what I'm trying to get here, and I, I need to be prepared to talk about this, is we this feature, this object ID, um, there has to be a, some knowledge, some shared objects between these two. So this guy may this guy may know all about coffee cups. Um, this guy does not know about coffee cups, but this guy also knows about the edge and the handle, uh, and this guy also knows about edges, something like that. This is a handle out of the picture. And so you can say, well, all right, so um, I, can't, I can't infer the entire coffee cup over here, but I can if I just trace the edges, or I can't, uh, you know, it, I, can, I can keep going until there's a common language between the two of these things. So all I'm saying is that it works whether you, trans you learn in both places or you only learn one place, and, uh, and you pass the components that are shared between the two in some body set. How does it work okay. if... If you learn different components that are non overlapping between two different columns, how do you infer that it's the same object? I think you have to have the same components. You have to be able to get down to some basic component. Um, so, for example, um, I mean, it, it could get down to as simple as edges, right, and, and curves. Um, and I'm arguing that both columns here have to know at least some common basic thing. And, and I may have to. I may have to concentrate. Like when I'm signing my name with my foot, I don't, I have to actually do it consciously think about it. I have to say, okay, I'm gonna move it up, and I'm gonna curve and down and under here and up and curve and down. You really have to think about it. When you sign your name with your, with your normal hand, you don't really have to think about it. So 
To, but but if the foot in the, if the foot never knew if I could never imagine drawing a line with my foot or how to move my foot in a straight line or a curved line, I don't think I could do this. Uh, another example might be what if uh, what if something was determined purely by I'm just guessing I'm, I'm making this up. What if something was really determined by colors only? Uh, and this was and then this is a tactile column, which can't do that. Um, and and the argument here that I couldn't well then I couldn't do time. I couldn't I can't imagine what it would feel like. Right, I, uh, I could say, oh, there's these different colors at different positions uh, relative to my body, but I can't, I can't imagine what that would feel like because there's no common language about color um, between these two. So it doesn't always work. Right? Um, um, same with sound. I can, I can, I can learn a, a, a melody or a sound of a truck or I don't know. I know my point is, it doesn't always work. There has to be some common component that goes between these two. I can say there's this feature at this location relative to your body. And as long as they can agree on that, then they can do this. But if the features can't be shared and then, then I wouldn't be able to do it. I don't know if that's what you're asking about. Probably, I think. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's, it's OK. So one, one good point you brought up, uh, you being Jeff, in this case, uh, the uh, these these descriptions of objects um, are typically allocentric. They're they're uh, they're not relative to the body. They're re here. I'll say this differently. The thing you want to learn, you you you, uh, if if you're gonna memorize something, you probably want it to be allocentric. You probably don't want it to be relative to the body. So you bring up an interesting idea that the thing being um, that the message is being passed sideways. Maybe they're always. The body. Well, I was thinking. Maybe you're, maybe I, was actually, thinking right. I was thinking. You know, there's this, and you know more about this literature than I do. That there's there's a cortical column, and there's this cortical columns. These are all cortical columns, and then there's a bunch of literature about like something called the striatum, um, which looks kind of like cortex, but it's not. It's sort of stuck in the corner, the center of the brain. Um, uh, and there's a lot of literature about how information goes to the striatum. And, and back up again. You were the first person to point this out, I think. Um, and striatum or clostrum? Both. Oh, uh, but, uh, but I but I kind of I kind of side with what you're saying. The striatum, I'm become I'm becoming more supportive. Well, maybe of maybe maybe you suggested clostrum, but I mean I'm, I think it's just striatum. I think that, you're right. That's that's what the literature says. So <laughs> so maybe you said the clostrum. Um, yeah, the striatum is big <laughs> suicide. It, it is <laughs> the striatum is associated with reference frame transforms. And and you know I have to go, I have a whole file of papers on I have to go read them again I've forgotten it um, but um, the idea here would be um, that you know going through this sort of reference frame reference to the body is kind of an odd thing because locally we don't really want that locally we want to you know reference frame to the finger to the eye or whatever right um, uh, in the object so this would be like okay this is this might be part of this whole communications method here that we broadcast, you know, um, we broadcast through here um, to other places. It doesn't mean there still isn't local communications as well. It just means that for this knowledge transfer component, there has to be a there has to be a, a pathway through uh, the body reference frame. Otherwise, it doesn't work. But it's so obvious now to me that you know, even when you hear something or you feel something or you or you visualize something, you visualize it in some position relative to the body. That seems to be your, your mental concept. Uh, not that you can think of otherwise. I can also imagine what's it relative to my elbow or something like that. But but normally you just say, oh yeah, I'm just locked to here, and I can. And that's why every, I can. All my senses can. I can even imagine. I can even attend to hearing something in this location. I can be standing here and say, I'm going to listen for something down here. You can just mentally do that right now. You can feel like, oh yeah, I'm going to listen to that spot. <laughs> so um, uh, so anyway, there might be this. Uh, um, clearing house of uh, transfers uh, to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't get rid of the local voting. It doesn't mean we still do local voting. Uh, we do, I think, I'm sure. But, but this could be like, okay, this could be the transfer knowledge situation. How do we get on that? But, uh, well, the, I brought up the, um, the transfer thing. Where the, the learned thing sh generally should be allocentric. In these oh. pictures, when we talk about transferring future location pairs, the displacements, the graphs, those yeah. are usually allocentric. 
but but your point, which totally might be right, maybe all of the transfer things are uh, in the body's reference frame. I just that that came out because it was also there was this uh, introspection observation yeah. about that. Also, it solved the problem of it, you kind of have to have this to do. Um, to, do the, to solve all the knowledge transfer problems. Yeah, it's also obviously important for voting as well, or if, if you can vote on these things, if you can vote on these things. Uh, yeah, you, you even brought up early with the, with the multiple fingers, yeah. where you said, you know, it's not each finger, um, it, each finger is not just tracking it, its own location, which makes it more like a bag of features problem, but you said they know where, where they are relative to each other. Yeah. Um, and uh, when I agree with that, I put that in the book, in fact, um, talking about the people dropping into a town. Um, so that would be, that's sort of like, um, the, the, something like this is, might be required to provide the common yeah. basis by which everyone can agree. Yeah, like I, you know, I, I'm at this location relative to the coffee cup, and I might be at this location relative to the coffee cup, but where are we relative to each other? Uh, if I don't know the relative positions of my fingers here, then, um, then I just have a bag of features. Um, and that is insufficient. Uh, uh, so, uh, what layers do these striatum connections go to and from? Uh, you know, great question. I don't know. I have to go look at it again. Okay. <laughs> you know, I don't know. My instinct is the deeper layers, but I, I'm not going to give a straight answer to this. I do. <laughs> I, I, I remember one. Okay, this is a really detailed neuroscience nerd thing. Okay, so I remember one now. <laughs> um, <laughs> In general, if you talk to a neuroanatomist and you say, what's in layer five, excuse me, five, they'll say, oh, there's two types of cells in layer five. These two types of pyramidal cells, the big ones and the little ones. And the big ones are the motor output cells. This is the out motor output of it. The, and then there's these smaller ones which just like the pyramidal cells. And these project um, long distances. These are one of the voting neurons. I mentioned the other day because there's, there's voting neurons in layers two, three, and there's these long distance ones in layer five, and there's these small ones. Then we read a paper once. So that was this is this is standard dogma. Big, this is called the layer five intrinsically bursting cell. That's because it makes these little bursts. And these PT, pyramidal um, track. Uh, pyramidal track is another name for it. Classic certain neuroscience using multiple names, the same thing. Um, um, and sometimes they're called 5A and 5B, but in some animals, the reverse, so you really have to pay attention to this. But there's little ones and big ones, and the big ones basically you have the motor output of the cortex. And the little ones project long distances, and we would say they're voting. Then we read a paper where someone said, aha, there's actually a third type of layer five stuff. Remember this? I don't think I remember this one. We said, that, okay, well, there's the big, big motor one, and then there's two flavors of small ones. And the only difference between these, these two look identical, except for one of them. So they, they look identical, meaning they project the same ways. He says, but one of them has a little extra projection off to where? To this right here. Um, and they made the case that there were two flavors of these small guys. <laughs> Does anyone else remember this paper? Yeah. <laughs> um, it was like one of these, like you could just get buried in neuroscience crap. And, and um, and this is one of those papers you could just say, I can't deal with this right now. It's just too much. You know, <laughs> I mean, but um, this, this particular science has argued, the elder is a second class of these small layer five cells. And then that begs the question, well, maybe there's, there are two different types of voting going on. Um, uh, we could probably find this paper. We did review it. We did a paper. Review on this. Well, I at least read it. I at least talked about it one time in this show. Um, and um, one could argue maybe there's two different types of voting going on here. And one of them is voting on the location relative to the body, and maybe one of them is voting on location relative to the sensor or something like that. Something like that. Um, so that was another um, data point. Um, Where did the dopaminergic neurons come from? Is that also striatum? Uh, no, I, I, I thought they, I don't know, I thought they came from. Um, Basal ganglia. So, um, yeah, basal ganglia. Which is just right. Which is part of this. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know which part of basal ganglia. Because those, those project everywhere. Basal ganglia, by the way, just to, if you don't know it, it just means lower stuff, lower, <laughs> lower nerve center. So, there's a whole bunch of things that are called the basal ganglia. There's just a whole bunch of little things. I just group them all together and call it basal ganglia. So, yeah, it, it, it's not very descriptive. It's one of many things. So, is, is striatum actually considered part of the basal ganglia? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. 
certainly. Um, I I don't know where the, you could probably look it up right now. Like and say, where do the dopamine? I think they project. Everything. They do project that, but where you're, asking, like you're asking where do they come from? Yeah. I don't know where they where they come from. It's somewhere. They project. <laughs> you know, those things will project broadly in layer one or something like that, and so it's more of a global learning signal than a specific um, information signal. Um, you can tell we're cortex people. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because someone would disagree. Well, like, no, no. I'm just saying that, like, uh, for some people, dopaminergic neurons are the center of their universe yeah, when they yeah. study the brain. So it's just, uh, it's just funny yeah. to see us have to ask, wait, where are those again? Well, because an experimentalist is something they can deal with, like especially with an animal like a rat, they can provide motivations for the rat. Rats hungry. These rats in these experiments are almost always hungry and thirsty. You don't like they don't remind you all the time, but the rats are not very happy. And um, they're really thirsty, and they really, really want to get something to drink. Um, and so they can then do these experiments on motivation and reward and so on. So they do all these motivation uh, things with dopamine. Um, but that's largely because it's something they can deal with. They can't ask the rat, "What are you thinking right now?" You know, "What are you? What's your perception of something?" And they, they can't deal with that. So anyway, yeah. So you know, dopamine projects typically broadly into like layer one or something, you know, and then it just infects everything about its learning and all the out of learning. So it's useful, useful for me to just check if uh, if uh, I'm going to try. I'm going to see if I can make the most radical version of this claim and see if you still agree with it. Uh, or rather, I'm going to I'm going to bring up why I why I feel. Uh, why I call this a slightly different flavor of a thousand brains theory that's compatible with it. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like, when I think of a, a cortical column processing input from your periphery, some, somewhere over here off to the side, um, the idea that that cortical column is learning entire models of objects, um, I don't disagree with it, but it's not the narrative that works for me. The narrative that works for me is that what is fundamentally doing is it's learning, it is learning to represent entire models of objects. Uh, and that is this fundamental thing. The, the idea that every single of your cortical columns is like a little straw that is that is each learning the objects. Uh, for me, it's like it's almost they're not quite how I think of it. I think of it as more it's learning to describe them. The memory might not live over there, like especially like way off in the periphery. Well, the periphery it might, yeah. it might not really be memorizing I, objects. I mean, this is talking about the peripheral vision because. Yeah. I agree. I mean, it's like the eye is like two things, right? There's the phobia, yeah. where everything seems to be all the sort of learning and recognition seems to occur through movement. And then you got the periphery, which is dominated by, uh, you know, the, the magnocellular sort of cells, which sort of detect motion, right? It's almost like one could argue that the, the outside of the eye is there just for, just for motion detection. This could be an argument. Um, that and that you're really not learning much out there. It's just like, you know, it's those flow bits. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true. I don't really know. Um, and so I'm open to both suggestions. I'm open to suggestions that, hey, these columns that represent the outside of your periphery are learning things, but they're not very good because they're very fuzzy, or maybe they're not learning much at all. And maybe that's what you're working. I don't know. Okay. Couldn't, it be, couldn't it be that those cortical of columns are just learning much larger things? They could, they, they could, but it's so much. poor that they're not, no matter what you do, you just can't learn much out there. Right. It's just, it's really, really impoverished data. Um, it's like looking through the fuzziest filter you can imagine. So, even is if it, it, is it is it actually impoverished or is it just over a, the, it's still the same number of inputs, it's just over a larger scale? Um, right. It's not like suddenly it's, it's, you know, I can see a question. Let's say, let's say we want to, just a resolution let's say we're, issue, we're right? trying to look at a coffee cup, right? And, um, and I can look at it through a straw in my center of my vision. Okay, good. Now, what if I give you a really big straw out to my side of my vision? Can you still recognize a coffee cup? If it was uh, 10 times bigger, yeah. Why not? Sure? I'm not sure. I, I don't know either. But I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean. I mean, someone must have done these experiments. Probably. I, I'm pretty sure I couldn't recognize letters. You know, I think, yeah, probably. I think I can recognize. I'm looking at more of this here. I'm looking at I can see it's a I mean, the number of 
raw <laughs> inputs coming into the cortical columns here is probably the same as the number of inputs coming in here. Probably, but, but it's they, just over a question, are, yeah. they, are they the magnetocellular or the parvocellular inputs? Because that really changes a lot, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be dominated uh, more by motion sensors out here. So one could argue that maybe it's going to learn them, you know, anyway, but maybe, right? Yeah, I can sort of see this. I could recognize big letters yeah. over here. Yeah. So I'm not sure uh, your distinction there, Mark. You're saying that, um, do you think maybe in the proof we don't learn these things? And uh, or that's the general tendency. The general tendency, the scenario you were just bringing yeah. up is probably most of that knowledge actually lived more in your foveal cortical columns. And to the extent that you were predicting what's over there, or to the extent yeah. that you could find the coffee cup in your visual field, the other scenario I brought up in this box, um, it, it often involved a knowledge transfer, like an on-the-fly yeah. information yeah. being sent over there. Yeah. You know, it could be. The equivalent in touch would be, you know, um, I, I learned how things touch things feel with my fingertips, but, you know, could I recognize them with the back of my forearm, right? I don't think I have a model of the coffee cup in the back of my forearm. Right. Um, I don't think, I don't think I ever, you know, I don't think it exists there. Um, uh, but your argument is I could infer it there. I think it's what you're saying. I could, if I really had to, I could be like, oh, well, what could this be? And I, but I have to really think about it, right? It's like I'm doing the knowledge transfer now. I'm trying to imagine what these, as I touch this, I'm trying to imagine some, draw out a little visual, almost imagery of what it is that's out there as I move my, my body around. Like this. Yeah. Um, so I think that's maybe right. You know, so it's not like, again, we've always said every column in the quarter context doesn't learn models. Maybe some, some columns are not very good at learning models at all. Maybe that's your argument. And that we're just using them for the, the, the knowledge transfer inference problem. Is that right? It's like, yeah, basically. Yeah. But I could also say some flavor of what Subutai was saying that, like, the, they do learn something. Your periphery does learn things, but it learns different things. Yeah, yeah. There are, yeah. Big, there are big things that are important. Yeah, to right. So, like, I noticed the other day I was in bed and I was trying to, it's really, you're lying in the dark thing. You, know, you have this really rich sense of where the blankets are and where my wife is. And, 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 and there's only these little touches on your body. That, and you somehow even know, like, you just know what those touches mean. You know, like, oh, there's an extra fold in the big blanket. And you know, you just know these things. And like, you this touching and it's, So one argument would be that, you know, yeah, the, the different parts of my body have learned, like, things like what it feels like to be on a blanket, right? Yeah. <laughs> but they don't learn things like coffee cups um, because they never touch the coffee cup. <laughs> but they do learn blankets. Um, one could argue that if I really, if I had to, if I lost my forearm, um, uh, do it on accident, then I could probably, I'd probably get really good at sensing things with my, with my elbow. Right? And, um, um, so I, I think that's, I think, to, I would rather say that the different columns learn different things. Um, they can all be subscripted uh, into performing an action. Like I could, I can infer with my forearm, I can draw my name with my toe, but I'm not going to learn that. So just because I learned something with my fingers doesn't mean everyone's going to learn it. Um, um, but everyone could imagine it, right? As I'm as I'm touching it, or I've, as I'm mentally walking through a model, I can broadcast it to other people and say, "Well, if I was in that location, this is what I would be feeling." You know, if I was at the location, I was in the body, with my elbow, with my toe. I, this is what I would. I think these are just nuances on the basic theory, right? And, yeah. I, and I agree with that. I, I do want to talk. While you brought this up, I want to re reiterate something I. I I mentioned the other day, which I think is really, really important. This same mechanism is the basis of language. Um, that you've got these language areas in the brain that are just cortical columns, like every other area, right? And um, they are able to, of course, move your voice box and things like that. Um, uh, but what do they? What do they want to say, right? If I wanted to. What they want basically to describe is what's being broadcast around the rest of the brain. You know, it would be saying, oh, well, Marcus is off to my right here, and I know uh, Jeremy's on the screen over there because I just saw him, and, um, you know, um, a coffee cup, uh, I forgot where I put them, right there. Um, and so I can describe basically what, is it, what I'm imagining or seeing over here. And all I need to know is say, you know, what is the object, what's its orientation, where is it relative to me? And almost that's like the core of almost all language. Is, is recreating whatever um, um, mental imagery or actual sensory input is occurring elsewhere. 
uh, if I want to generate something, and even if I'm talking about something I'm just thinking about mentally, it's the same basic idea. There'll be columns representing some sort of concept, and, and they're going through their machinations, but it's still being broadcast. As long as, as long as I can associate these, these, these objects and their orientations and their positions all to the body, then this guy can describe it. And similarly, if I get, if I get auditory input um, and I recreate what's going on in your head and I pass it around the rest of my brain, I can imagine what you're seeing. You can say, yes, Jeff was just describing the coffee cup on the table. I can imagine the coffee cup on the table. And, and, and then there's the car out front that had an accident. Yes, I can imagine that. Um, so uh, it, it's how like do you do that if you don't have a relative to the body part? Like What's that? How do you do that if you don't have a relative to the body? Well, it's a good question. I don't know. I mean, um, like describing something that is not here. Like, well, let's go through an example. Let's see. Like, uh, eight, one plus one equals two. How'd you go there? Yeah. Well, um, let's pick something I don't know so that you're trying to describe something that I don't know. Um, well, okay, the relative to the body part is an interesting question. I don't know, I don't have the answer to that in, a, in, in any, um, anyway, I'm just trying to imagine like describing something mathematically. Uh, um, if I were to describe uh, a mathematical problem to you, and all we could do is talk, um, how would I do that? I would probably use visual language to do that. Even if I was describing this an equation, I, or I would, um, um, uh, I don't have to say where it is relative to my body. You can imagine it anywhere. You might imagine it right in front of you. I say, Lewis, you know, I'm dealing with this integral right now, and it's between, you know, blah, 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 and blah, and we're differentiating over this, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, you know, you probably mentally build up this image in your head of that same thing. Um, would it be, I don't have to say where it is relative to my body. Um, so that's an interesting question. I don't think it's a fundamental flaw in the idea. You know, I'm still describing something that you're going to make a visualization of in your head. I'm just like, for the, for the location that goes to that fire. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what would happen there. Uh, interesting question. Um, you know, it's interesting. I don't, I'm not worried about it. <laughs> the other thing, going back to something you said earlier, Marcus, um, just is sort of uh, uh, somewhat related to this. You could pass you could vote, you could pass around some, something that you're looking for, right? Here's something I'm looking for. And, um, and I think the same mechanism might work. Uh, and you might even know, basically, you might know what orientation to expect it to be in, yeah. but you don't know where I'm going to where it is. The point is that all these guys could be biased to find that thing. Yeah. You know, where's Waldo? You know? um, yeah, I don't know if I, I, it would be interesting to see if you played Where's Waldo and you turn the body of Waldo sideways to the strikes go up and down, would it be hard, harder? It might be, because if, if you're looking for Waldo, you're probably always assuming it's vertical. <laughs> I don't know. I, mean, I, thought, I, thought this, I thought this is really interesting about language. It's, it's, language is always really weird to me because in the cortex, the idea is that somehow information flows hierarchically through the cortex, then it gets to language, the language areas, then it flows back down to do things. And it was like, how does that work? And why does language seem different? It's like, you know, what's, how does language abstract something from the visual scene? And, you know, all these weird things. This solves that very nicely. It just says language is it's just another set of columns where are getting the same descriptions. And they can now turn those descriptions into a physical manifestation of written or spoken language. Or they can, um, or you could, you could feed in some description to them as if they were sense organs. So if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm parsing language and I understand it, then you can pass that as if it's just sensed in itself. And then these guys can visualize it. So it just makes language areas just like uh, every other area um, in that regard. They, they, have, they have a sensory input with some senses to words, and they have, a sen they have an output which is creating words. And those words are describing the same objects that we're describing up here. Um, Passing the same around. So, so that I, I thought you know, if we ever wanted to do language stuff, that was like a key concern. I'm also trying to understand, yeah, like just the framing of the problem. If if you're trying to look for like a 
common language descriptor that works between all of all of the columns or or like a way that the columns can each learn a common language between each other but it can be different between the different if i think of it as right here at heart i would say well the location relative to the body would be common to all the columns like sense hearing touch and vision the orientation of the object is probably uh, um, common to all the columns. And then the actual features that, um, that exist are com common to subsets of columns. Um, and, but it wouldn't, I don't think you'd learn it on a column by column basis. Um, I mean, if part of what's going on is the column has to get votes from a bunch of other columns and figure out what's most consistent with the evidence, then you would, it would, seems like it's advantageous to have the same language, otherwise it's... Yeah, it would be the same language, but you can't always have the same language. My point, there are sensory inputs that, are, that can't be shared. There's certain objects that cannot be shared. I can't visualize a melody, unless you're really good at music. Well, um, um, in, in synesthesia, you can, right? Yeah, that's, that's, a, <laughs> synesthesia, the best theory about synesthesia is it's a it's a a, a, a wiring mistake in the brain. It's not yeah, useful. I agree. But so so we can ignore that because it's really not useful. It doesn't really help you much at all. It's just a, it's just a spillover wiring effect between two columns that are adjacent to each other that actually represent different sensory modalities. What about something like these multi-agent scenarios where you have little simple things that are going around there that are trying to do something common. And so everyone's sensing something different, but they're trying to recognize something common or do some common goal. Or well, I think in some sense, like that's, that's, that's kind of what's going on in the cortex. That's, right? so that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, so we, you're saying we don't care what's inside the column. Uh, it's just that they're communicating on something that's common to all of them and inferring things from partial information. Yeah. There, there's, you could imagine some multi agent or some multi. Yeah, well, I could argue that my body is a multi agent intelligence system. Yeah, right, yeah. right. And yeah. so every patch of my skin, the retina and the parts of the cochlea are all, parts of them are moving together, parts of them are moving independently, and uh, but they're all communicating with each other. Um, and so the same basic principle could apply over broad areas, but I mean, like I could have multiple sensors moving around the room independently of each other, it wouldn't, wouldn't work much if, if some sensors were, you know, physically remote and couldn't even be sensing the same thing. Like, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, that kind of thing wouldn't help if you have some sensors in the city and some sensors in the you know, park and you can't even observe the same thing. It seems like they have to be able to somehow at least have, this, they can imagine attending to the same physical location. That seems to be a requirement, attending to the same physical location. 